we are gathered here today because I want to talk about what I believe is the second best movie of the year. All right. I, if you follow me on Instagram, I said that I was going to post a video about this when I got home from the place where I was not at home. <laughs> I am now home and I saw Dr. Sleep on Friday, whatever, a couple days ago. Now, I've been very excited for Dr. Sleep for months. I've made a couple videos on Dr. Sleep. Y'all don't care. Y'all didn't watch them. But I am making this review anyways because I have a lot of things to talk about because Christ, it was so fucking good for like no reason. Like I genuinely think that this movie is the second best movie of the year behind Midsommar. And Midsommar is like very high up on my all time like best movies list. And I know you're going to say, what about It 2 and The Goldfish? Goldfish is probably number three. It too, I love it too, but it too is not like, but and like I don't know how to explain this without like offending people, but like, it too was kind of like funny, feel good, kind of like it's not a feel good movie, it's really fucking sad, but like as far as like serious cinema goes, I guess like I will like it's one of my favorites of the year, like obviously it was the one that I was like most excited for, but as far as like quality. I feel like I'm being offensive. Oh, um, my quality movies. My top three are now Midsommar, Dr. Sleep, The Goldfinch. So we're going to talk about Dr. Sleep because I have a lot to say about Dr. Sleep because it also ties into some stuff that I want to say about it because I think it reinforces a lot of theories that I and a lot of people have had about it. So Dr. Sleep, if you don't know, is a book by Stephen King and it is the sequel to The Shining, which is... The movie adaptation of The Shining, the Stanley Kubrick film with Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall, is my favorite film of all time. Just period. In general. In any genre. I think it's art. It's wonderful. If you haven't seen it, what the fuck. It is the classic Stephen King tale, along with, like, Carrie, I'd say. Now, this was a book, obviously, that Stephen King wrote. And then they made the Kubrick film. And Stephen King very famously, blatantly, does not like the movie at all. He hates it, you could say. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. But mo the main difference is that they changed some things toward, for in the ending. And I'm going to explain that because that ties into my review. Stephen King does not like it. Now, I think it was 2008, he wrote a book called Dr. Sleep, which was a sequel to his original novel, The Shining. Now, disclaimer, I have not read the entire book. I've only read the first couple hundred pages, so I really cannot, like, give more than that. But, he wrote this, and now, this year, ye ol' Mike Flanagan, one of, who I believe is one of the best directors of our time, he directed The Haunting of Hill House, wrote and directed The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix, which if you have not seen that, it's a mini-series. It's like an anthology series. There's only one season out right now, but each season is going to be different. Um, it's like horror, suspense. It's fantastic. Like, very high-quality cinema. Um, very well filmed and directed and all that stuff. So, like, when they said that Mike Flanagan was directing Dr. Sleep, I was very excited. I thought we were in very good hands. And we were, in fact, in very good hands. So, now, they came out with this movie. But, going back to the Kubrick film, this movie is a sequel of the Kubrick Shining. So this is going off of the ending and the circumstances of the Kubrick adaptation of The Shining instead of the book, original book version of The Shining, and therefore taking everything that was in the book version of Doctor Sleep. Now, you might say, that doesn't make any sense. Because didn't Stephen King, like, work on Dr. Sleep a bit? Like, he produced or some shit? Yes, he did. So, big props to Stephen. <laughs> but you know what? It was worth it. Because wow. Like, wow, wow, wow. This movie, wow, wow. So, if you're unaware, this movie follows Danny Torrance, who it was the kid in The Shining. The little bicycle kid that he was, like, the, the, the one of the main characters. So, it, I'm not going to explain The Shining to you. You should have seen The Shining. If just, just that's it, period. <laughs> you should have seen The Shining. So, follows Danny Torrance, the kid from The Shining. Uh, 
30 years later, approximately. Like, it's like, he's a fully grown adult now. Okay, 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 this movie, wow. So it follows him for the most part. It also follows his girl named Abra, who has The Shining. It follows Rebecca Ferguson's character, Rose, who, wow, absolute legend. Oh my god, like nothing but respect and awe for Rebecca Ferguson, you know? She's the antagonist. She basically runs this creepy cult-like thing of vampire-like people. They're like these people were basically like in this universe. So like this, like this whole movie was sort of going off of the lore of The Shining and it's basically established that if you have a shine, if you shine, then you have this like steam in your body that when you die, like the steam like comes out of your body and this vampire cult, they like absorb the steam. Like they breathe it in, like they eat it. And it's like a vampire where like they drink blood, where it's like they live off of this steam of people who shine. Where So they're tracking down people with the shining and there's because they're eating them. Um, but there's this like theme of how like a sh like the shine isn't as common anymore. And it's basically like Abra is like this very, has a very, very powerful shine and she is able to sort of communicate with Danny um, from a distance because they have their weird mind thing. And then they sort of go on a little mission to like shut down this cult. And it's so fucking good. Like you might listen to that and be like, that's really weird and not at all like The Shining. And you know what? That's why it works, okay? This movie was so fresh. Like they really could have like rehashed everything that we already known in The Shining and like done a very similar concept, but instead they just went completely out of the environment that we were used to and dealt in, and, and, and dove into a modern setting and used different people. And like, it was so interesting and so bold, but it worked so well. I was saying to my mom after we saw this movie that there's a very thin line where this movie could have crossed and gone wrong, where it could have been very campy and trashy and showy, and it could have just been, like I said, like rehashing all the classic Kubrick things, which we're gonna get to that because there was a lot of that at the end, but it was tasteful. This movie was tasteful, and that's very hard to do with something as classic as The Shining and such a staple, like Kubrick is such a staple director, um, and they somehow managed to like integrate like Kubrickisms into this movie and like Mike Flanagan is such an iconic director as well like he loves his blue lighting like if you know you know like he loves his blue lighting um but there was just it was just so cool I'm gonna go into spoiler territory for a bit and then I'm gonna cut back to non-spoiler stuff and talk about what I meant with it and um those things so I'm gonna put a timestamp here of where you can skip if you don't want the spoilers if you want to see this movie because you should see this movie but don't see this movie if you haven't seen The Shining because you won't appreciate it as much also it might not make much sense um it's too bad okay so the visual effects were like wow okay so the part when Rose is like she like went into Abra's mind and she like astral projected like into space and was like coasting along. Wow, like I got chills. And like when she went into her house and I love the whole concept how their minds are like filing cabinets. And like that whole scene was so visually spectacular and interesting. I just loved all the cool visual nuances they did. Like when Abra was like on the window and she like floated when they were in the grocery store and she was like talking to her like through the the glass and it shut like wow bitch the vi wow like very creative stuff and that was um I think really like the Flanagan staple um that's like that very much gave me his vibe um also like just Rebecca Ferguson like wow because here's the thing from what I've heard like I said I have not finished the book but from what I've heard she's a fairly uninteresting character in the book and she's pretty bland and straightforward and from like I said what I've heard she really turned this character around and made her like one of the best antagonists of the past couple years in movies like this and I agree with that I think that she was such a strong character she was threatening but you saw her side of things and she was just very interesting to watch um but like wow legend also Ewan McGregor since we're talking about actors Ewan McGregor nailed it I am a Ewan McGregor fan though I love Mul Moulin Rouge is probably in my top five favorite films of all time like wow Ewan McGregor I would know but he was like the perfect choice for Danny like it's really hard to like 
choose an older actor for a, like a five-year-old like uh, Danny was five in The Shining so it's not really as if it's not really like his personality reflected over because like as like he didn't really like he wasn't really a fully grown personality as a five-year-old child but I think Danny I think Ewan really captured like the pain and like the struggle and at the beginning of the film when he was going through like alcoholism and drug abuse and stuff I think he did a good job channeling that and also like the pain with his dad and the fact that he lost his dad so young and so like he didn't really know him which is so interesting because like we're watching The Shining and we're like this is these are the characters but if you think about it now like seeing Danny as an adult like yeah he wouldn't really remember that much about Jack which is I like that a lot I think that's interesting so like the struggle of him being like all this traumatizing stuff happened to me because of my dad but, like, I didn't really know who he was until, like, he went to Alcoholics Anonymous and, like, got, like, that whole, ooh, okay. But, speaking of Jack, I want to talk about the last act of the movie because, oh man, if you're watching this and you just want spoilers and you don't care, so the last act is in the Overlook Hotel. And, like, bitch, okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, when they were driving up to the Overlook, it was the exact same opener as the original movie, but it was at night, and, like, it was perfectly parallel with the same music, like, wow, I cried. And just, they did so many parallels, and this is what I said, where it's like, this could have, this whole last act, yes, it was very fan y but it was fan service with taste. It could have been campy and trashy and rehashy, but it wasn't. So, they recreated the like the like they, like the part where they had Danny like do oh my god okay so my favorite my absolute oh actually no I had like two I had like three it was the whole last act was beautiful and made me cry but um I love the part where it was Rose and Danny and they were on the stairs in the room with the typewriter like the big open lobby and it was a parallel to the part where um Jack and Wendy were going up the stairs when he was starting to lose his mind they did the exact same choreography like you, like Danny had the axe and he was doing the same swings at the same time that Wendy did with the bat Rose had the same pacing she did the same arm movements like that is some attention to detail right there and that as like a hardcore Shining fan who maybe you wouldn't notice if that was exactly the same if you haven't watched The Shining as many times as I have but like that I was like wow that comes from a point of love and respect for the source material and I really appreciate that as someone who noticed that. Also my favorite scene in The Shining, well I guess there's a couple of them but I really like the first one in particular, um, the scene where Jack is in the gold room at the bar with Lloyd and he's doing that first monologue, one of my favorite film, like one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever, it's so good, such good writing, and they recreated that with Danny and they had Lloyd the bartender beat Jack and like bitch I can't even tell you how fucking brilliant that is, that's so good and like wow the visual cinematic camera parallels wow I want to die it was great also I love how after I love how like because the concept of the boxes was in the book I definitely read that part in the book where he had the book where he had the boxes in his mind where he kept the demons and so then when he opened the boxes I love that it was all like the, like the demons from the shine so it was like the twins and it was Grady and it was all of these people that like he recognized and then I love that like once they attacked him like and he was chasing Avra he did the exact same like iconic Jack Nicholson like that that run with the limp and he was holding the axe the same way he had the same jacket it, but in blue like oh man this movie they really did that like wow they did that they really did that and I'm wow was that and then like they were in the maze oh my like it was just it was all wow I want to die it was beautiful I want to cry again <laughs> okay and so anyways going back to the Kubrick thing I do, can't really speak off of this because I haven't finished Dr. Sleep the book but I'm going to bring it up because I want to introduces as a concept. I think it's really interesting that the way they ended this movie and the entire last act taking place in the Overlook, because the Overlook does not exist <laughs> after the events of The Shining, 
in the book because Jack uh, sacrificed himself for Wendy and Danny and blew up the boiler and therefore blew up the hotel, which is what the, happened at the end of Doctor Sleep. Danny blew up the boiler and blew up the overlook to get Abra out of the hotel. And I thought that was really cool because I'm like, wow, Stephen King really out here bringing back his original ending, like The Shade. We love that. But also because... I obviously that means the last act of the book does not take place in the Overlook and everything that happened is not in the book. So I'm very curious to read the book and if it's, if it's something that I really want to talk about I'll come back to that but I just wanted to introduce that concept. I think that's really interesting how they did this as a sequel to the Kubrick Shining so that they could have the hotel in it and I think that was smart because the act of the hotel was stunning. Also the fact that Halloran is dead in the Kubrick universe and not in the book universe um I think that it was really smart to have him be like a vision of Danny's because that scene at the beginning of the movie where he was talking to Danny on the bench and introduced the concept of the boxes that was in the book but it was in person like because he was still alive and he was still there and he was sort of looking after Wendy and Danny so I think that that was really smart to have him sort of be like this like thing that he sees for guidance like a mentor type of thing good good job we love that Hi, editing me. I can't believe I didn't say this in this video, but like I didn't talk about the flashback casting. Like I brought up Jack briefly, but like wow, okay. Uh Wendy was amazing. Like I don't know who that girl was, but like her voice, like she sounded exactly the same as Shelley Duvall and like her hair and like wow. Okay. Great. The kid was great. Kid didn't do much, but the kid was great. Wendy was really the standout for me, and then uh, the guy who played uh, Jack, like, really looked like Jack Nicholson from, like, certain angles. I'm like, wow, we stand. I can't believe I didn't say that. <laughs> so, yeah, spoilers over. Um, I, wow, like, I just enjoyed it so much. I don't really want to say a lot more because, like, that's, uh, those are sort of, like, my big things that I wanted to talk about. I just thought it was very consistently good. Oh, also, wow, Jacob Trembling blessed we don't deserve that kid so talented he was only like two seeds i'm like wow um but i want to talk about it and carrie actually because what this movie did and i'm sure what this book did which i find very interesting is introducing the concept of different types of shine so previous to this we had only seen experience the shine of danny and halloran because they were like there were very few characters in the shining and they were the two characters who had the shining and they had very similar shining where they could sense things and they could read minds and as such but what i think this is so cool about this lore is that there that they introduce that there are different kinds of shine so it's like mainly it is like a sense where it's like knowing things before they happen but it's also like lots of other things on the in the case of the blonde girl at the movie theater i'm blanking on her name but she her shine was different where she could send people she had like voice command stuff where she could send people to sleep and stuff like that and so i'm like that supports the theory that i've had for many many years that the losers club has the shining which is probably going to be the title of this video so i don't know why i'm acting like that's a big reveal so I've always thought the Losers Club has The Shining because I just think it's the in the circumstances of it how everyone in the town was just so unaware of everything that was happening and somehow Pennywise picked up on this on like these acute children who like most like they didn't really know each other like the core four uh Bill, Stan, Richie, Eddie they knew each other but they did not know Ben they did not know Bev, Mike, whatever they did not know each other how he like picked up on these distinct children and that these distinct children were the ones who survived first of all because all the other children that he picked on as far as we're concerned are dead um that he picked up on these kids and these kids were the only ones who actually took an initiative to do anything about it and i think that that's because they had a shine and they had just a sort of like i think that that's why they sort of knew that no one else was gonna do anything i think that the concept of the dead lights also ties in with the shining especially with chapter two of it how Beverly knew how each of them was going to die after she was put in the deadlights. I think that the, the deadlights have some sort of impact on The Shining which could be totally true and that's in other books. I know the deadlights are in other books of Stephen King's um which I need to read. Hi editing me is back. I feel like I did a really bad job explaining things and I didn't explain this well enough. 
I also kind of miss the most obvious thing where it's like Pennywise is a demon and the whole thing with the shining is kind of being able to see the dead and demons and such. And so like the fact that they could like see him in all of these different forms, like all the time and he could like fuck with their realities, like the shining. Also, when I was talking about the blonde girl in the movie theater, when I said that she could send people to sleep, uh, where I, what I meant to say was, <laughs> yes, she could put the people to sleep, but she could also, like, she had, uh, charm speak, where, like, she could say something to a person and they would do it, that like, she could make people do things. And I think that, like, this is a real stretch, but the way that the losers kind of killed Pennywise was, like, them making him think he was small. Like, I'm- I'm just in the movie. Like, I'm just saying. Like, considering that we're- I'm sticking to the movie-verse here, in general. But, like, I'm just saying. But, I just think that that's a really cool concept, and so then that also goes off of Carrie, because Abra in, uh, Doctor Sleep had some Carrie abilities. It's really interesting, where she can, like, find people, and she can also just sort of, like, what is it? Telekinesis? Move. She, like- moved her through her you know what i'm saying i was watching it and i'm like oh it's i'm like oh it's cool like she's like 11 like she has 11's powers and i was thinking about it i'm like well 11 has carrie's powers like 11's powers were modeled off of carrie and i was thinking about it and i'm like carrie has the shining because like wow like really like stephen king is out here and like obviously like this is just a theory <laughs> just a theory not a fact um that like, I don't know if he's, if that was on purpose, that, like, the losers and Carrie, and I'm sure lots of other characters have shining tendencies. Maybe they don't. Maybe that's just a total coincidence. Maybe they do. And that was his purpose. But I just wanted to share that, because I think that's a really cool concept, because It and The Shining are my two favorite Stephen King, uh, stories, and I think that's cool, and I think that that kind of makes sense. So, either, if you agree with me, cool. If you don't, that's fine. <laughs> it's just a theory. Anyways, thank you for watching this video. Go see Dr. Sleep. Go support it. Uh, comment, like, and subscribe. Turn on my notification bell because I don't have an uploading schedule. Come to my It Musical watch party this November 23rd, Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have more info about that in my last two videos. But yeah, I'll be here live streaming. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Go watch Dr. Sleep.